section here at the bottom of the main page at visitdsc.org. And I want to say thank you, too, for your faithful support in giving. Just click that blue Give button here on our main page. Finally, God bless you as you follow the Lord. And now let's join worship as it's already begun. Tell us, help us out on this part. I am free to run. I see you. I am free to run. I am free to dance. I am free.
thank you for the freedom you granted. So free to run and dance and live for you. Amen. Amen. Everybody's got long sleeves on today. It's, it's blistering. It must be 60 out. We're going to make it through, though. We turn the heat up, we'll be all right. It'll be 70 by the time we get done. So glad you're here. Welcome to church, in the cold part of the year. And uh, boy, we're blessed, aren't we? It, uh, it's a beautiful place to live. Look at the mountains today. Thank the Lord you're here and not in the windy city. I just heard before service in, in, the, in Chicago today, it's with the wind chill, it's minus 29. Oh, oh. they're going to de-thaw sometime around March. We, yeah, I remember our family, we lived there. I was doing grad school at Wheaton and I can remember that. I can remember filling up my car with gas on Roosevelt Road in downtown Wheaton in January saying, Lord, take me home. <laughs> take me home. And he said, keep studying and get good grades. That's what he kept telling me. But we are glad you're here. A lot of things happening in the church and uh, kind of warming up now so I can think of them now. And uh, first of all, I want to encourage you, come to the hymn sing. The class, uh, Senior Adult Ministry, the class is sponsoring a hymn sing right here next Sunday at 4 o'clock. Sing all your favorite hymns. I even put in a request for my favorite hymns, so we'll see what happens. And that's next Sunday at 4. Marlis Prochu is going to be playing the grand piano right here for the hymn sing in the sanctuary. And uh, we're bringing in a grand piano for Marlis because she deserves it. She does a fabulous job. You'll love it. Uh, bring your friends, come out, and sing the great songs of the faith to the Lord next Sunday at 4 o'clock, and she'll give us a little sample uh, next Sunday morning. So be sure to be here next Sunday morning. Choir is going to sing, and then uh, Marlis is going to be playing a few great uh, songs of the faith for us next Sunday morning. So that's coming up. Hymn sing next Sunday, 4 p.m. Don't come today at 4, or you'll be singing songs to the Lord by yourself. So come next Sunday. Then, uh, you know, the discipleship, the all-church discipleship uh, conference is coming up. Saturday, February 3rd. That's in just a few short weeks. We'd like to invite you to sign up today in the lobby at the table in the lobby. It's the only table in the lobby you can sign up at. And uh, I know I'll be signing Sherry and I up today. I, I, I was convicted this week. I keep telling people to sign up, but I have to sign up. So doing that after this service in the lobby, that's my plan. You can sign up as well today for the All Church Discipleship Conference. Some great speakers coming in from around the country. And uh, uh, you're going to see some short video clips starting today from some of our speakers uh, during video announcements. Uh, lots of other things happening. Check your program for things coming up. I'd like to invite the host to come forward and let's pray for the offering. The plates may be cold. <laughs> I just keep going on that, don't I? I don't know why. I, I don't know. I got to stop. Dear Lord, thank you for how good you are to us. Thank you for your many blessings. Lord, today we thank you that we. Uh, come together to worship you, and you warm our spirits, you, you strengthen our resolve, and you bring that joy and that peace back into our lives, Lord, that we would trust in you, depend on you, and know that you alone are God. Lord, today we love you, and we thank you for all of the blessing. Lord, we commit to you all of the concern and all of the struggle, and God, we thank you that you uh, work powerfully in the lives of those who love and reverence your name. Lord, work in these matters which concern us, we ask, for your glory. 
And Lord, we do put our trust and confidence in you. Today, we offer you a portion of what you give us in our tithes and our offerings. Use it for your glory, we ask. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Welcome to Desert Springs Church. We're so glad you've joined us. If this is your first day at Desert Springs Church, please stop by our Connecting Place counter. We have a gift for you and want to thank you for coming. Senior Adult Class meets every Sunday morning at 915 in the loft. If you're over 60, please join us for hymns, humor, and inspiration from God's Word. Equipped by Christ is almost here. If you or someone you know would like to become a better disciple maker, be sure to sign up for this one-day mini-conference right here at Desert Springs Church. Hello, friends at Desert Springs. I am Vicki Gatchel with Navigators Church Ministries in the Fort Wayne, Indiana area, and I can't wait to come out and be with you on February 3rd for your conference, Equipped by Christ. We're going to talk about disciple making and discipleship, and uh, we're going to talk about the reason why creating a culture of disciple making within your church can bring about not only change within the church, but change within ourselves personally to see transformation in Christ and how that overflows out into our community as well. It should be a great time to be together that day of talking about intentionality. I'm also going to be helping to give a workshop that day called The Invitation. The Invitation Workshop is all about how God has been intentional with us. He's given us an invitation to come and be with Him every day to get to know him, to spend time with him, and to learn and really grow in our relationship with him. During the invitation workshop, we're going to learn to sit quietly before the Lord, to listen for him, to hear him and respond, and then to live out what we hear from God and do that on a daily basis. I can't wait to have discussion with you, to hear how God has been leading you in your church, and to find ways that you all plan to walk forward together in making disciples. I'll see you in just a few weeks. To reserve your spot on Saturday, February 3rd, stop by the Equipped by Christ conference booth in the center of the lobby today. Sunday in the park, of course, after church. Civic Center Park, January 28th at 1230. Families with babies to high schoolers, we will have a barbecue lunch provided Bring your bicycle. We'll have devotion and kids ministry update too. Come hungry for food and fellowship. January 21st is Baptism Sunday. We have parents and children being baptized. If you'd like to be baptized, please let one of the church pastors know. Thank you for loving Desert Springs Church through your tithes and offerings. We really appreciate your generous support. If you'd like to know more about Desert Springs Church or to give online, please go to www.visitdsc.org for everything else that's happening. All right, we're uh, back in the book of 1 Timothy. We're uh, rapidly wrapping up uh, 1 Timothy. Today we're in 1 Timothy, the second portion of chapter 5, verses 17 to 25. Uh, our topic, as you can see on the screens, pastoral practices. Now, uh, this uh, sounds a little self-serving when a pastor's speaking about pastors. And uh, so I, I just want to make clear there's, there's a great encouragement to pastors here, and there's also great um, uh, admonishment, great reminders, and great uh, instruction to pastors as well. So, uh, you know, it's interesting when you go through a book of the Bible, sometimes you come upon topics that aren't usually preached from the platform. And uh, today, again, is one of them. Last week, we heard about the importance of caring for the widow and others who need special care. Today, we hear about uh, requirements for the pastorate and uh, what you should expect from the pastor of the church where you attend. And so uh, some of this, of course, uh, here at Desert Springs is directed to me and to our pastoral team. And, but wherever you go and, and wherever uh, those in your family, those your extended friends, those in other parts of the country, these are tips that you can pass on. And uh, when I say tips, I need to, to say that more effectively. Uh, these are uh, true obedience requirements for the pastorate. They're non-negotiables, and we're going to be looking at them together today. This is our 12th week together. We're in the downhill run now, uh, wrapping up uh, chapter one in first, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, first Timothy here in uh, January. 
and then 2 Timothy in uh, February and March. Now, um, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, several weeks ago, in fact, it was last year, uh, seems like a long time ago, but it was only a month or two ago, uh, verses uh, 1 through 7, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, we've already encountered uh, several requirements for the local church pastor. And as you recall, they are to be a faithful husband to one wife. They are to have children who honor the Lord. And uh, they are to have a family that is generous and trustworthy and respectable. Now, if we were to travel on past the books of 1 and 2 Timothy into the book of Titus, uh, we would find in Titus chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, again, the same qualifications from 1 Timothy 3. Uh, for the pastor, and then additional warnings uh, of poor pastors who should not be doing God's work. And so in Titus chapter 1, verse 10, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers. They should not be doing the pastorate. Verse 11, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. They should not be pastors. So again, this would be a pastor who would have self-serving interests, teaching things from the pulpit to expand their own wallet or expand their own uh, list of benefits in life. Verse 14, who turn away from the truth. In other words, pastors who aren't true to God's word and they start coming up with their own ideas and wow, aren't I brilliant? I've got a new thing I want everybody to know. They're not to be pastors. Verse 15, both their mind and their conscience are defiled. And so when you find twisted thinking in a pastor, they should not be doing the office. Verse 16, they profess to know God, but by their deeds, they deny him. And this gets into the fruit coming out of a pastor's life, should be honoring the Lord. And we're going to end today on that very important topic at some length because it's so critical. See, pastors carry a spiritual responsibility, as we're going to see in our text this morning to be who God calls them to be, genuinely and uprightly, in a committed relationship with God's people, the church. Now, here in chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, we find some added priorities for the pastor, not uh, found already in 1 Timothy chapter 3 or in Titus chapter 1. And these are the main texts in Scripture, these three combined, where we find the pastoral duties and the accountability of the pastor to the church and to God himself described. First, we see in verse 17 here of chapter 5, pastors are to be diligent and respected. And these are the two aspects that are sort of bookends. They go hand in hand, one with the other. Uh, uh, verse 17, the elders. Now, uh, notice in your uh, English translation, it may well say the word elders. And I just want to remind us again today, as I have earlier in the series through 1 Timothy, that when we uh, see that word elder in Scripture, we're really referring to the pastor of the current day church. The pastor of today very much fulfills what was called the elder of the early church. Now, we have elders at our church. They support me and support the pastors and the ministry here. But uh, the elder today is not the one in our church who does the primary leading of the church in the preaching, the teaching, the ch uh, church visitation, uh, the uh, sacraments, etc. It's the pastor. So whenever you see that word elder in scripture now, uh, just think pastor. So the elders or the pastors are to rule well and are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. All right, so there were these three pastors and they met together and they said, boy, uh, I've just never had a share group like this. I think we should all just share our biggest problems in life and then we could pray for and support one another in this little uh, uh, pastoral relationship. And the first said, great, well, I'll go first. My biggest problem is I don't work hard enough. I come in late every day, I leave early every day and I get my Sunday messages off the internet. Whew feels good to get that off my chest. The second pastor said, wow, funny you should say that. My biggest problem is I like to stay home as much as possible. I always act like I'm sick when I'm not. I cancel my appointments and I watch TV all day in my pajamas. Oh, it feels better to tell you guys that. And then the third pastor said, well, my biggest problem is gossip and I can't wait to make a few calls. 
So <laughs> our scripture today here in verse 17 on this topic of pastoral accountability and pastoral responsibility before God and before the church uh, is uh, number one, to demonstrate a dedication, a priority, and a faithful laboring for the work of God and for the people of God not to slack off and not to slumber. And uh, we see in Ecclesiastes 9 verse 10, whatever your hand finds to do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. In Romans 12, 11, it says that we are not to be lagging behind in diligence, but fervent in spirit serving the Lord. To be honest, I've never really understood pastors who didn't have enough to do. Uh, my list grows all the time. But uh, God's word reminds us here today that pastors are to be diligent workers, faithful laborers for the kingdom of God. And uh, for that work, for that consistent, hard investment in God's body, the church, we are in turn to be honored and respected for our dedication to Christ's cause. Now, we know that God is not in heaven relaxing right now. He is actively, aggressively, lovingly working in the lives of individuals, over seven billion of them alive on the planet at this moment, calling them home to him through his son, Jesus Christ. So in the same way, ministers are to get after it. And the Bible says that's, that's not an option. It's not a personality type. Every pastor is to be diligent in the work because there are souls at stake for all eternity. And uh, in turn, we are to be respected in order to keep our hands free and not tied to go ahead and keep pushing forward well. Secondly, in verse 18, pastors are to be supported. And uh, it says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. So uh, pastors need the church family's partnership. We need your financial support, but also in relationship as well, which points back to verse 17, as we just read, uh, worthy of honor. And uh, I think on behalf of our whole pastoral team, uh, for uh, Jim and Lorraine and Colin and I, we say thank you. Thank you for your support as we invest into the lives of our church family and then out into the community. And thank you for the honor, the respect you, you extend to us, knowing that we're just people too, so we say thank you. It, it's hard, uh, at times in my ministry years ago, it was hard to shepherd the sheep when they're um, biting me <laughs> and uh, refusing to stay near. <clears throat> And uh, it, it's a full-time work shepherding. If you ever study shepherding, it's not like you say, well, you know, I'm going to take a vacation for, no, no, no. The sheep will go. You've got to be there all the time, always being mindful, always being watchful. And a good shepherd loves his sheep. And uh, I believe on behalf of our whole pastoral team, we want to say we love you. We love you in the Lord. And, and as you want good for us, we sure want good for you in Christ. Well, verse 19 says that pastors are to be upright and accountable. And now we begin to really get into the importance of this. Verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder. That would be in today's vernacular, a pastor, except on the basis of two or three witnesses. So pastors are to obey the Lord in their personal lives, and they are to respect what's best for others because sin always harms others, not only oneself. And uh, if pastors are not obeying the Lord, it needs to be brought up to the church's added leadership. In our case, the board and the elders, because pastors are meant to invest in lives, to build others up, not to tear down and destroy them. And uh, yet, Scripture tells us that uh, we are not to be accused by just one individual uh, because there are those who simply want to discredit ministers and bring false charges, uh, but there should be confirmation with others that would say, yes, I'm, sadly, that's true. And uh, I think on this topic of discrediting ministers, it's why I always seek to meet with others in public 
and uh, I won't go to, to a meal with a lady. And uh, if you're a lady and we're having a meeting here at the church, I'll have a, my assistant Sharon or someone else sit down with us. And uh, it's because uh, we want to protect everyone's relationships and not have a false accusation come. Now, verses 20 to 21 say that pastors are to be held to obedience, held to obedience. And it says those who continue in sin rebuke in the presence of all. Now that's interesting, isn't it? That scripture says that if a minister is continuing in sin, uh, and it's assumed here that the leadership has spoken to them about it, that if they continue in it, they are gonna be rebuked in front of the entire congregation, so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. So ministers do not get off the hook. In other words, honoring or respecting a minister does not mean they get to go out and have free license to disobey God in their personal lives. Indeed, the actual opposite is true. They are held by the highest standard. They are required by God to honor the Lord in their lives. And uh, you know, um, this is why we have a board. This is why we have elders. And uh, they're all posted online uh, uh, at visitdsc.org, our website. And uh, you can speak with them. You can call the church. You can ask for how you can reach them because uh, we have an accountability structure because it's too important. It's the Bible and it's the way God says things must be done. Now, it's interesting that it talks about uh, not doing this without, with a spirit of partiality. And that's because at times pastors can become popular. And some ministers are very popular. And uh, uh, they can even become your personal friend at the local church level. And yet, Scripture says if they are dishonoring God in their lives, they must be called out. No exceptions. No matter what. And uh, why is it that pastors need to be held accountable to obey the Lord in their lives? Well, it's scriptural. And I'd like to share with you at least four good reasons why you can't let up on your pastor, that they honor the Lord personally. First, we know that scripture says pastors are to demonstrate living a new life in Christ. And none of us live a, a perfect life. There have been times I've had to apologize to people, times say, you know, I'm sorry, I was out of line, or, you know, forgive me. That's part of being a, a fallen sinner, and, and we're sinners needing a savior as much as the congregation. And yet we are to seek to honor the Lord and live for him. Now the apostle Paul urged this in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. And you see, what the shepherd knows is that the sheep will follow. And so when you have a pastor who's going down a wrong trail in life, others will begin to follow after that. And it's very, very bad. So pastors are to demonstrate living a new life in Christ. This is one of the reasons why they must be held to account in their behavior. Secondly, pastors are to support their own biblical teaching and uh, to not be hypocrites. Now, there are many Sundays where I'll tell people, you know, I'm preaching to myself this morning. I need to be more loving. I need to be more forgiving. And it's true that uh, all of Scripture impacts us. You don't become perfect and then become a pastor, but you must be obediently living with him to be qualified to uh, step into the role. And so we read in Philippians 1.27, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So uh, I want you to know we tithe here at the church. I would never speak to you about giving money to the Lord unless that's what we were doing. I tell you that we need to honor the Lord in our relationships. That's what we do. It wouldn't be right of me to tell you that from God's word if we weren't doing it. And I'm to teach uh, all of this based on my own life conviction of doing it in my own life personally. And uh, it's so sad when people uh, learn that a pastor has been living a double life and uh, they have not been honoring the Lord. They have not been doing here, number two on my list, supporting their own biblical teaching. It's critical. It's not optional. And our text here today describes it for us. Thirdly, uh, another important reason 
why uh, pastors need to be held to obedience is pastors are commanded by God to honor and obey him. James 3.1 says, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that as such you shall incur a stricter judgment. So there is an accountability before God uh, it, when you're a minister to honor the Lord in your life. And then fourthly, I just want to say, pastors know better. They know. And don't let them ever tell you, oh, I had no idea. Oh, well, I didn't real. Oh, I guess I made an oopsie. That's, that's horrific language. It's complete denial, and it's not true at all. We know better. We're told in Acts 20, verse 27, and this is our takeout verse of the week. It's on a little card in the lobby for you. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. And you know, you should never have a pastor on a staff even who hasn't read through the Bible, who hasn't studied the Bible, who doesn't know in its entirety what the Bible has to say for our lives. So if you're foolish enough or ridiculous enough or, or uh, just naive enough to think that anyone can do it when they haven't studied the Bible, you're wrong. And uh, we know better. We know what God has told us to do and what he's told us not to do. You know, just like when you have your kids and they're growing up and they get in trouble and you say, now you knew better. And they'll start to make their excuses and yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, no, 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 no. You knew better. And that's true of the pastor. And so they're held to obedience for the sake of the health and the obedience of the entire church family. So in morality issues, in finances, in giving, in the pastor's attitude, in the pastor's actions, we are called to obey God. And the church is to honor the Lord and not to support sin. In other words, when it speaks of not doing this in an attitude of partiality, you can't say, yeah, but we like the guy so much, we're just going to let it slide. You can't do that, not for a minute. The disobedient pastor wounds God's people. And prominent or not, every pastor needs accountability. All right, verse 22, pastors are to be chosen wisely. Now, you don't just spin a spinner or just see who's available. And uh, it's so important. It says, do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. Now, when it's talking about the laying out of hands there, it's of course referring to the text we've already gone over in a previous week together. It's the laying out of hands for the, the calling, the anointing, the affirmation to ministerial work. And uh, I remember when I was installed, it, I don't know why they call it installed, it's like you feel like a refrigerator. But when I was installed to the senior role here, we had other prominent ministers come and on the platform lay hands on me and pray for me in that role because you need all God's help that you can get. And uh, so that's what it's referring here today. When you decide to install someone to the pastorate, take it seriously. Don't just take a few hours on the weekend and, and pick the best candidate from your five options. Don't rush into pastoral relationship. That's what it's saying here in verse 22. Why? Because not all are called. And of those who are called, not all are qualified. And of those who are called and qualified, not all are upright. And of those who are called and qualified and upright, not all are committed to Christ and his people. Pastors need to be called by God, qualified for the ministry role, upright in their personal and their public living, and dedicated and dutiful, motivated by love for God and God's people. And you know, it's because churches uh, have a design to them. It's not just, hey, let's just kind of get together and hang out. God has a plan for the church, and it's a support structure for us. Churches are to be houses first of worship, of worship to God, and second, they are to be houses of instruction in God's word. So we're to be places of worship to God, instruction in God's word, and then a place of encouragement, encouragement, connection, 
and support for one another. And that's what we want for you. And this is the primary role of the pastor, to say, Lord, how do we uh, get, maintain, and, and foster a house of worship and a house of instruction in your word, the Bible, and a place of spiritual encouragement and connection and support one believer with another. The pastor should foster these priorities for the church family. And uh, uh, scripture says here in verse 22 that new believers are not to be put into the pastoral role. The devil has far too many ways to get to them. Trust me, I know. We need to grow in our faith before we step into pastoral ministry. The pressures of the pastorate are very real, and leaders in the church must respond spiritually. As pastors, we have to forgive regularly and extend grace rapidly and give all that we can and hold on to that supportive role and trust the Lord in every difficult situation. And when you hear of a pastor falling into the sin of immorality or pride or greed, they're taking too much for themselves or deceiving the people financially, it's because of this. They are not responding to the pressures of the pastorate correctly. They're looking for an easement in their spirit through a wicked means. So uh, ministers should have a proven track record. You don't choose pastors lightly or superficially, ever. Then verse 23, to balance the scales, uh, pastors are people too. And uh, it's interesting here that uh, the Apostle Paul is inspired by God to give a personal word of, of support to young Timothy there, where he's leading the church in Ephesus. It says, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. It, it appears to me that even in the early first century church, there were those who would have been upset with Timothy as a pastor for uh, drinking some alcohol. Now, we know the wine in those days had a lower fermentation rate, but regardless, uh, Paul's saying here, Timothy, it's medicinal. And um, uh, no doubt, uh, in my reading of this, what comes to my mind immediately is that Timothy must have been fearful of criticism, fearful that members in the church would berate him or put him down or say, well, you can't do that. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, Paul says, yeah, but Timothy... This isn't even for your enjoyment, it's for your health. If you're not well, you can't lead the church. And uh, I would just say here, and, and you know, people have often asked me, you know, do you drink? And I don't. I don't because uh, it's not a good idea for me. Now, that doesn't mean that as a believer in Christ, you can't drink. The Bible just says in Ephesians, don't be drunk. But uh, for me, uh, I choose not to. Uh, Sherry and I just don't because uh, we think we're, uh, for the role that I take, uh, we're better without it. And I've often said that if I did drink, I'd have two martinis every night, and that'd be before dinner. <laughs> and I really would. So uh, I, I just need to steer clear of that, and I do enjoy a good cup of coffee. And, uh, you know, uh, it's funny in life, we always think about what we don't get instead of what we do get, don't we? Oh, you know. And uh, God is good. And sometimes you just have to be smart in life. And I'd say to you, you know, do what's smart for you. Uh, do what's smart. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is, this is smart. This will help you. And so uh, sometimes we get hung up in the minutia rather than doing what's right. Now, uh, the great thing about church is this is to be the place where we're real. We're to be real. Uh, imperfect people who love and serve Jesus Christ together. And uh, scripture says we've all fallen short in our lives. We're all sinners saved by God's grace when we accept Christ personally. Uh, but we are to be courageous enough to be who we really are and watch as God works to change us and transform us. And um, uh, so uh, Paul reminds Timothy to be real and to do what's best for his health here. Verses 24 to 25, pastors are to be displaying good fruit. Now, as chapter 5 ends here, uh, we, we come into something very important, and I think this is a litmus test for the pastoral ministry role. 
The sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. In other words, verse 24, sometimes you can see a person while they're sinning. Other times you won't realize what they were doing till later on. Verse 25, likewise also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. In other words, your sin will find you out eventually. Now, this very much speaks to this topic of pastors needing to display good fruit. Displaying good fruit. And uh, this is so critical when you're evaluating the one for pastoral ministry. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. So here is the key. Hear the spiritual teaching of the Lord. You don't know them by how good they look. You don't know the false prophet by the nice outfit they wear and how much they compliment you or how good you feel after you, they speak. You know the false prophet by their fruits. You know the genuine pastor by their fruits. You evaluate by what's coming long-term from their life. Now, I want to tell you a true story. It's related to Jesus' parable of the fig tree found in Luke chapter 13. And you may enjoy reading that today in Luke 13, verses 6 to 9. Uh, just four brief verses as Jesus told the importance of uh, studying a tree for its fruit. Uh, I'm not uh, going to, uh, uh, ala uh, uh, I guess, uh, make this story bigger than it is because it's a big story already. It's very accurate what I tell you. Uh, Sherry and I have a couple of fruit trees in the backyard. We planted them for one simple reason. Citrus trees just tend to grow themselves here in the desert. And, uh, but we did have in mind that we would get some fruit from them. Uh, scripture, Jesus himself tells us that a fruit tree is evaluated by its fruit. The value of a fruit tree is the fruit it produces, all right? So uh, with these few fruit trees in our backyard, we have a large grapefruit tree. It is a really good looking tree. It's the best looking thing in our backyard. It is green, it is full, it is rounded. But I will tell you something, we got no good fruit from our grapefruit tree. Not one good grapefruit. The only thing that our grapefruit tree produced this year were two faulty large grapefruits that were misshapen and moldy, fell from the tree, and they were rotted from the inside. Now, we also have a tangerine tree in our backyard. It is scraggly, and I mean scraggly. Uh, it has very thin branches, the leaves just don't seem to stay on very well, and uh, it's really like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. That's the best way if you saw it right now. I should have brought a picture. We, we almost cut the tree down last year. We were so disgusted with it because, you know, you turn the water on, you, you wait, you anticipate, you get excited, we're going to have some... Nothing! last season. In fact, Sherry and I had a conversation, we had a meeting just on that one tangerine tree. And we talked about it. And I mean, I had a saw in the garage. I was ready to do some business. And I remember we agreed, we talked about Jesus' parable in Luke 13 that I just told you about. And we decided, you know what, we're going to give it one more try. This thing has never produced tangerines. We're going to give it one more try. And so we had a prayer. We didn't fertilize it. We didn't do anything different. We just prayed. Lord, if it's your will for us to keep the tree, help it to bear some fruit. Otherwise, it's going. Thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Had a prayer. We did. And uh, now, this is the time of year when fruit trees in the desert, the citrus trees, should be producing. And um, I just want to tell you what happened. And, and it's a perfect sermon illustration because it's absolutely true. We have hundreds of tangerines on the tangerine tree. Hundreds. The thing is so weighted down. We've been having orange juice. We use our blender morning and night every day for over a month. And we're going to keep doing it for two more months. We have so many tangerines. We've been giving them to the kids. And uh, when they come to visit. 
And uh, there, I actually tried to count them and I gave up. The limbs are bending over from the weight of it. And there are some fruit rats in the neighborhood and we don't care. They can eat all they want because there's so many left. And uh, that's what's going on in the midst of the beautiful grapefruit tree that won't produce anything worthwhile. Look, sometimes we get tempted to want to look good to other believers, like our grapefruit tree. So others will say, aren't you robust? Aren't you green? Aren't you wonderful? And that temptation can come to pastors as well. They just want to be glorified and lifted up and treated special by everybody in the congregation. Look, that's not how we behave in the family of God. That's not how we're to do it. Uh, how we look is not the standard for determining a solid believer, nor a good, grounded, godly pastor. We need to look at the fruit that's coming out of their life. Some choose their church like they're choosing what car they want to drive. How does that church look on the outside? How many people go there? How successful are the people who go there? Does it make me feel like I've really made it in life? How will others think of me if I am seen walking into this particular church? Look, we need to look at the fruit. We need to look at the fruit, starting with what's coming out of the pastor's own life. As a pastor goes, there goes the church. It is not the superficiality of the local congregation that matters, the attractiveness of it, or the seeming size and success. Listen, if your pastor is trying to impress you, that is a big problem. If your pastor seems greedy at all, that is a big problem. If your pastor may be misbehaving, that is a big problem. Pastors are called to lead the local church of Jesus Christ. But make no mistake, it's God's church, not theirs. And the Lord is to be honored and lifted up. And we together are called to be his faithful servants, pointing others to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And that completes chapter 5. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for how you love us, for how you care for us. Thank you, Lord, that your counsel is always right and just and true, that you always want the best for us, that you're intimately concerned about the matters which concern us. And God, how we pray for the church in America. God, that we would be the church of our Lord Jesus. That, Lord Jesus, we know we are in the end times and that when you come soon, that you would find your church in America honoring you, faithful to you, diligently serving you, being right and true. Forgive us, Lord, when we get caught up in the Hollywood mentality or the attitudes of social media, just wanting to do the cool thing. Instead of, Lord, really turning our hearts over to you, and living for what's real. For Lord, your kingdom is real. Your ways are righteous altogether. And we long to revere your name and do what's right before you. Lord, today I pray for the one who's had wounding in their life due to a church experience, due to pastoral leadership in their lives. God, would you heal them and restore them and lift their eyes to look up to you for, Lord, your word says we're to fix our eyes on Jesus. And then, Lord, we as your servants, strengthen us. Strengthen our hands for the work and help us to be faithful to you always. For, Lord, you alone are worthy of all praise and glory. And today, Lord, we bring to you our concerns. Lord, for those we love who are sick and afflicted, for the relational situations each of us face, for the financial concerns present in the, in the church family today, for all of those important decisions some are needing to make, would you be in the middle of all of it, Lord, and do a great mighty work for us. For Lord, we love you, and we give the church back to you. She is yours, Lord Jesus. And we pray that 
you would dwell among us and that we would come to honor and reverence your name. Now, if you're listening and you're not sure you've ever invited Jesus into your life, you can do it right now. The Bible says that for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And if you believe that Jesus is God's only son, that he died for your sins on the cross, and he rose from the dead three days later to give you a new life forever in heaven, if you believe that and you're willing to turn from your sin to live for him, he's willing to come in your life and forgive you of everything and help you to go his way. And the Lord will help you do that. He'll forgive you when you don't. So if you need the Lord in your life, just talk to him now if you've never accepted him. Accept him now. Or if you want to use this prayer of your way of recommitting your life to Jesus, you can pray this as well. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you're God's only son, that you died for my sins on the cross, and rose from the dead so I can live with you forever in heaven. Please forgive me of everything and come in my life right now. I'm willing to turn from my old ways to live for you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Would you stand? We'll close with a blessing. Sorry I went a little long. And uh, you've still got 10 minutes if you're going to the class to get upstairs, have a coffee and a donut, and get some good fellowship in. Members of our prayer team are coming up right now. And if you have a prayer need in your life, would you come forward at the end of service? And we'd love to pray with you. And uh, hang around. Again, you can sign up for the Discipleship Conference. You'll put a big smile on my face if you do. Right out in the lobby. I'll be out there too, signing Sherry and I up. And uh, that's coming up on Saturday, February 3rd. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May God make his face shine on you. May our God be generous to you, give you his peace, empower you in a new life, and use you for his glory. Amen.